Hi everyone, my name is Natalie and I'd like to welcome you all at the University of Constance. We are so, so happy to have Ed Winters here tonight, who is a public speaker, animal rights activist and educator based in London. He's very well known under the name Earthling Ed, especially in the vegan community. So I cannot tell you how excited we were when we found out, which was actually on my birthday this year, that he wanted to come and give a talk at our university here. Thank you, Ed. That really was one of the best birthday gifts I could have ever gotten. <laughs> Since we unfortunately weren't able to book the Audimax for tonight, but did expect many people to come, we organized a live broadcast, which is taking place downstairs. But I think most people are already down there, so that's fine. <laughs> um, so the whole event will also be recorded and published online. Once we have the link to it, we will post it on Facebook on the event page, so you can share it with all your friends and family and everyone who couldn't make it tonight. Or, of course, you could also watch the talk again if you want to. Lastly, I just need to inform you that there will be photos taken tonight, since this is a public event. Now, in the name of the vegan sorority of Constance, I wish you a pleasant night. And thanks again for coming and for your attention. Thank you so much. Um, for, thank you for the introduction, first of all. Um, happy birthday. I think that was pretty sweet. Oh, I know. Yeah, yeah. Happy birthday for back when it was your birthday, obviously. Not just randomly. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, but thank you all for coming down. Um, is the live broadcast happening through that camera there, then? Oh, amazing. Well, hello if everyone's downstairs. That's cool. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to come and listen to me. Uh, I'm going to talk about a few different things tonight. And so before I talk about any of this stuff, I always like to say two things to people. And the first thing I like to say is please take everything that I say with a massive pinch of salt, right? What I mean by that is please believe that everything I'm saying is a lie and I'm trying to manipulate you into feeling a certain way, right? <laughs> Because I'm going to talk about some ideas, I'm going to name some studies, talk about some statistics maybe, and I want you to think that I'm using it as a form of propaganda. And then what I want you to do is go home and have a look into it yourself. Because the thing is, right, we can watch TEDx speakers or YouTube videos or documentaries, and we have a habit of taking everything that's said on face value, don't we? But it's so important that we scrutinize information that's given to us, we look it up on our own and then reach our own conclusions. That's so important. And the second thing is at the end, depending on how long I talk for, I won't talk for that long, we'll have some time for question and answer, right? So if I say anything during the talk that you think, oh, that doesn't make sense, or I missed something out, or you think of something that I don't address, then hold on to it, and we'll try and get through as many questions as we possibly can, because I think that's really important. It's not fair for me just to sit and talk and then run out before you can question me about anything. So hold on to those questions, and let's see what dialogue and conversation we can have at the end. Okay. Before I want to talk about the main topics, I want to tell you a little bit about myself, because I think it's really important to talk about who I am as well, so you have some idea of who it is that you're listening to. And so, we're going to talk about veganism tonight. Right? Actually, this is funny. I did a school talk yesterday, and I said, we're going to talk about veganism, right? And this girl, oh, she was like maybe sat over there somewhere, and she went, oh. <laughs> and I, I was like, I, I, I'm totally with you, right? I used to feel the exact same way. And I thought, well, you, know, you don't have to like me, but unfortunately, you do have to listen to me. So try and make the most of that at least, right? We're going to talk about veganism. I think it's important to state that I wasn't born vegan, right? I wasn't born vegan, and I wasn't even born vegetarian. I was raised in a family where we used to laugh at vegetarians. We thought they were hilarious, right? We'd sit around the dinner table. We'd eat, like, some chicken breast or whatever. And my stepdad would say, oh, you know, what's the best thing about having a vegetarian round for dinner? And then I'd be like, oh, it means more meat for us, right? And then we'd all have a good laugh about it. It's, it's, it's just not funny at all, right? But we thought it was hilarious. I remember being 12 years old, and I was sat in an English literature class. We were stu studying a book. And in the book, there's a vegetarian character. My teacher says to the class, she says, what do you think about being vegetarian? Right? I put my hand up in the air, and my teacher's like, yes, Edward. And I say, all vegetarians are pale, weak, and skinny, right? Which was super funny, because I was like the weakest and skinniest in the room, and I ate meat every day, right? Whoosh, over my head, right? There was a girl sat behind me called Natasha. I turned to look at Natasha, because Natasha was a vegetarian. I thought when I looked at her, she'd give me like a big thumbs up and be like, I feel weak and skinny all the time, Ed, right? 
But when I looked at her, she was really angry at me. Like, she was furious, like, really cross. Kind of took me back a little bit, actually. And so I, I turned to look at my teacher, hoping my teacher would maybe give me the thumbs up or at least the, you know, the recognition I'd said something that was right. But she looked at me, and she was really concerned. You know, like she was going to get into trouble. She was worried. I said a lot of things when I was 12 years old that were obviously just completely nonsensical. It didn't make sense at all. But I think I remember that moment because it reinforces how his children we're like sponges, aren't we? What I mean by that is we're, we absorb what's given to us, information that's given to us, which is really important because as children, we can't defend ourselves or look after ourselves. And so we rely entirely on the guidance of those around us to make sure that we stay safe. And so we take what's given to us through what we're told as being honest because our survival, we well, used to, especially when we were less civilized, depended on those around us being honest and giving us good information. And so as children, we're so gullible because, well, we have to be to look after ourselves. We're told don't talk to strangers, you know? We're told don't do this, don't walk out there, check the way before you cross the road. And we're told, well, you need meat for protein as well. And so you get to a certain age, at least I did, where I never really critically analyzed the way that I'd lived. I never really thought about the things that I did, and I never even for a second assumed that you could live without meat because I've been told my entire life that I had to eat it to survive. But like blank canvases, aren't we? Think of like an imaginary blank canvas. Our values, our beliefs, our morals, our lifestyles are given to us almost wholly by our families, by our cultures, by our traditions, by our environments, by our societies, and we just become products of the world that we grew up in. We don't often challenge ourselves to think differently about the things that we've always done, of course. Let's flash forward a little bit. I am now, how old, 18, seven years ago, and I'm buying pizza with a friend. My friend is vegetarian, and I had no problem with my friend being vegetarian because he never said a word to me about it. I thought it was great. I thought it's so nice that he's vegetarian. I love that. But just don't ever talk to me about it, right? And then one day, we're ordering a pizza, and he says to me, oh, the audacity, he says to me, Ed, why don't we just get one pizza, we'll make it vegetarian, and we'll share it, right? And I looked at him, I said, this is obviously a joke, right? You know me, right? This is a joke. He said, well, Ed, why not? I don't understand. I said, well, there's a very simple reason why not. Because bacon goes on pizza, obviously, right? And if there's no bacon on top of it, that, that's some fake pizza right there, right? And I'm not spending my money on no fake pizza that has no a vegetarian pizza. Come on. He said, Ed, I don't think an animal should die for a pizza topping. A pizza topping. Right? We give pigs life, they live a very nice life in a farm, it's wonderful, they're killed, they're killed of course, but it's done humanely, so what, what's the problem? And then at the end I get bacon, right? it's called the food chain, isn't it, for goodness sake? Pigs given life, I get bacon, amazing, just like in nature, right? He said that that wasn't a good enough reason, but I was too stubborn to care, and so we got a half and half, he had his veggie half, I had my bacon half, right? Now let's go back five and a half years ago. Up until this point, I'd never considered why I would want to stop eating animals, not for a second. I didn't even want to think about it. I loved eating animals. I thought they tasted amazing, part of my habits, my routines. I'd never considered it. But five and a half years ago, something happened, which forced me to reevaluate, well, so much within my life. And so I was reading the BBC online. I came across this story. And the story was about a truck carrying 6,000 chickens crashing on the way to a slaughterhouse near a city called Manchester, which is in northern England, of course. I remember reading this story and feeling pretty horrified because the journalist had said that 1,500 of the animals had died from the crash alone. Just 1,500 lives taken in just a split second. But that's not really what upset me. What upset me more was the fact there were hundreds more of these animals who were alive, but they were in pain and they were suffering. So they had broken bones, you know, broken wings, broken beaks. They were being crushed by the trucks or the crates they were being transported in. And that made me really uncomfortable because I recognized for the first time, it's such an obvious realization, of course, but I realized that the animals I consume have the capacity to suffer and feel pain. So obvious. And because they can suffer and feel pain, they have a preference to avoid suffering and pain as a result. And then I said to myself, well, look, Ed, right? everything's getting a little bit out of hand here. Just chill out for a second, OK? The, crush, the crash is a rarity. It doesn't happen often. Like once every million journeys, maybe. Who knows? Look at the farming and look at the slaughter. 
And if the farming ends slaughter's fine, then you've got nothing to worry about. And so I Googled it, and I watched some videos of, of what chicken farming and what chicken slaughter looks like. I felt worse. I couldn't believe what I'd watched. I thought, I'm paying for this? If I say I'm against animal suffering, but I see something where animals are so obviously suffering, that goes against my values. And the problem is, in my fridge at that time was a KFC, because fried chicken was my favorite food. God, I love fried chicken when I used to eat animals. I thought it was the best. I had a KFC that was a five minute walk from where I used to live. Five minutes is dangerously close, right, for your favorite food. Dangerous, five minutes. So I went there so often that the workers knew my name, Ed, and they knew what my favorite order was, which was a Zinger box meal. I used to get a hash brown and we called it towering up. But there in my fridge was the leftovers of, my, leftovers of my towered up fried chicken. But I was reading something that made me feel deeply uncomfortable. I reached a, a crossroads in my life, if you like, the cliched fork in the road where you can go one way or the other. And so the first thing I could do is I could bury my head in the sand, couldn't I? Just think, Ed, rewind 15 minutes, pretend this never happened, and just carry on as if everything's normal. You're, what, 18? You've got another 60, 70 years of life if you're really lucky. So maybe just try and ignore those feelings of being a hypocrite for as long as you can. You know, who knows? Maybe you'll be all right, maybe. But at the same time, well, actually, I don't know if you guys have seen it. I'm talking about the original Spider-Man films. Not these new ones. Right? I can't stand these new ones. I think they're rubbish. I'm talking about the old ones, right, with Tobey Maguire in and Willem Dafoe, the good ones, where he's the Green Goblin. It's so good, right? In that film... Uncle Ben says something very whimsical. He says, with great power comes great responsibility, the classic line, right, from Spider-Man. Now, I believe that knowledge is power. And when we learn something about ourselves or about an industry or about something we didn't know about before, we have a responsibility to act on what we've learned, especially when we, what we've learned is so intrinsic to the way we live and the values that we have and the way that we live has such a consequence on the lives of others. And so I learned that I was deeply uncomfortable with the process of what happens to animals. I learned that I was paying for something that went against my values of saying I was against animal suffering and I was against animal cruelty. And so therefore, I had a responsibility to act on what I'd learned. And so I changed. But at that point, it was just a vegetarian, just a vegetarian. And I was one of these vegetarians, right, who thought that vegans were mental. I couldn't stand vegans, right? I thought they were self-righteous. I thought they were arrogant. I thought they were preachy. I thought they were militant. I thought they needed to get a sense of humor. I was like, vegans, for goodness sake, crack a smile. The world's not that bad, right? Cows produce milk and hens lay eggs. So just chill out already, right? What's the problem? I used to say, I'm never gonna be vegan, never. And then one day, I watched a documentary called Earthlings. Now this documentary, which is free to watch on YouTube, talks about all the different ways that we use animals, right? So not just for food, but for dairy and eggs, also for clothing, so for leather, for fur, for entertainment as well, for like aquariums and circuses. The film's about 90 minutes, an hour 40. It's brutal, like it's horrible, horrible film. And afterwards I was feeling a little bit shell-shocked, a little bit distraught. At that time I had a, a hamster called Rupert as a pet. I loved Rupert the hamster, he was the best. Whenever I felt sad, I'd give him some food and I'd watch him eat because the hamster's eating is like the most adorable thing you could ever see in your life. It's, it's so cute. And so I thought, you know what? I need to give Rupert some food and then I'll feel okay again. So I go and I get Rupert. I give him some broccoli because Rupert loved broccoli. Wow, he loved broccoli. So I've got Rupert. He's eating some broccoli. He's running my hands on my arms. And I look at Rupert for a moment and I say to myself, my goodness, Rupert the hamster is a little individual. He's got such a little personality about him. So like I said, he loved broccoli. He wasn't a big fan of kale. He would eat it if it was the only thing he had, but he'd look at you like, really? <laughs> kale? Which I actually, am, I, I empathize with that. If someone gives me kale, I'm like, really? Come on. But he loved broccoli. Now I studied German in school only for a couple of years. I'm not very good at it, but the one thing I remember, which I suppose is poignant, but also quite sad, is mein Hamster ist gestorben. And it's true, uh, Rupert is sehr gestorben, which is sad, right? It's sad. Loved Rupert, but Rupert is definitely done. Anyway, <laughs> but not only that, right? Not only did he like broccoli, but he was also really lazy, was Rupert the hamster. He was so lazy. You know, of hamsters, you get in the wheels and they run in those wheels for like hours and hours. Or you get them a ball and they like run around in the ball around the room. Well, I bought Rupert a ball, thinking it'd be the most amazing thing in the world because he could just run around all night, right? But actually, every time I put him in the ball, he'd just take the food from his cheeks and sit there and eat, and he wouldn't run anywhere. I said, Rupert, come on. 
It's good for your heart. Do a bit of cardiovascular work. Go on, have a run. He wouldn't do it. Wouldn't run anywhere. Such a little personality. And I looked at Rupert in this moment, and I thought, I recognize so much in Rupert, but bless his heart, right? He's not the most intelligent animal that's ever walked this planet, right? He's amazing, but he's not the most intelligent. And so if I recognize so much in Rupert, so many attributes, traits, and qualities, then I have to, by default, recognize them in the pigs, the cows, the sheep, the chickens, all the animals who are conventionally exploited for me. And if I would hate for someone else to hurt Rupert or to kill Rupert, then what right do I have to inflict pain, suffering, and death on animals who are alike in every single way that matters? I couldn't quite fathom that. And that's why I went vegan. But I was a quiet vegan, right? At the beginning, I was very quiet. I was really afraid of being labeled as preachy, which as you can tell, I'm not too worried about now, right? Like, but at the time, yeah, no, not, yeah, that's a good one, that one. No, I'm not worried about it anymore. People call me preachy all the time, and I get it. I do talk a lot, right? But at the time, I was really worried about it. And so I was at university, I just had some friends. My friends were lovely, they weren't vegan, and I didn't ask them anything about it. I went into university, I ate my lentils, didn't say a word. But then one day, I watched this documentary on Netflix, called Cowspiracy. Now, Cowspiracy talks about all the different ways that eating animal products is bad for our environment. And so I was at university with some climate-focused friends. They were very concerned about climate change. They used to talk a lot about it. And so I thought, you know what? I'm going to go into university. I'm going to tell my friends to watch Cowspiracy. They're going to watch it, and then we're going to be one big vegan family, right? And we'll eat lentils and talk about animals and stuff, right? It'll, be, it'll just be so cool, right? Wishful thinking, of course. Spoiler alert, that did not happen, right? So I go into university the next day, and I'm like, you guys, watch this documentary. It's called Cowspiracy. It's on Netflix. It'll change your life. It's about the environment and eating animals. And they're a bit like, well, whatever. This one girl, Rihanna, she wasn't really my friend. Okay, we'll just put it out there. But she was listening to the conversation. She says to me, she says, Ed, I think it's great that you're vegan. I think that's, oh, I think that's so wonderful. I just really like that you're vegan, Ed. But, you know... As a vegan, but, but as a vegan, right? You consume soy milk and eat tofu. And actually, soy farming is destroying the Amazon rainforest. And so you want to talk about the environment, but you're the one who's responsible for deforestation in the Amazon. And I took a step back for a moment. And I thought, is this true? Is this true? I've never heard this before. I'd never heard this. Sometimes non-vegans call vegans soy boys, don't they, to try and insult them. But I actually am a soy boy. I'm proud of that. Like, that's not an insult to me. And so I'm thinking to myself, here I am a self-proclaimed soy boy, and soy farming is destroying the Amazon. Well, hang on a minute. Does that mean that I'm responsible for that deforestation? I don't feel good. I went home, and I Googled it, right? If in doubt, Google it. And so that's what I did. I Googled it. Is soy farming bad for the Amazon rainforest? Lo and behold, soy farming is devastating for the Amazon rainforest. It's one of the major causes of deforestation in the Amazon, and these wildfires as well. But the more I researched about it, the more I kept seeing these same figures, which is that up to 85% of all the soy that is grown is fed to livestock animals. And that 85% is grown in the Amazon, which means that the problems related to soy farming in the Amazon rainforest are because of the animals that we consume. There's actually an expression. It says, if you want to protect the Amazon from soy farming, eat soya, because the soy that's made for vegan products is grown in places like Europe or North America for people who live in North America. And so actually, Consuming soy milk and tofu isn't the problem with soy farming in the Amazon. Rather, paradoxically, it's the animals that we consume because a lot of their feed is soya. To put this into perspective, in the UK, according to something called the Centre for Agricultural Strategy, which is actually an animal agriculture think tank, it's pro-animal agriculture, it says that in the UK we import 1.83 million tonnes of soya every single year from the Amazon rainforest to feed our livestock animals. Some figures say it's 2.5 million tons of soya every year into the UK just for livestock animals. Now, to put that into perspective, that's between 900,000 hectares and 1.5 million hectares of the Amazon rainforest that's used just for soya farming, just for the livestock animals in the UK. We're a rather small nation. Germany in size is substantially bigger. In agriculture, pretty big as well. And what I found really distressing about the importation of soya for livestock feed is that actually just over 50% of all the soya that is imported from the Amazon rainforest is fed to chickens for their meat and for their eggs because soya is one of the biggest elements of their feed. 
which is kind of strange, isn't it? Because when we talk about animal agriculture and the environment, we get hung up on red meat, don't we? Cows and sheep. And of course, they play a huge part in this as well. And a lot of people will stop eating red meat and start eating chickens and maybe more eggs because it's seen as a more sustainable alternative. But actually, when it comes to the deforestation for soya in the Amazon, the biggest culprit as an animal are the chickens for those free-range eggs that we eat or that chicken breast that we like to cook up or that fried chicken that I used to eat, which is kind of alarming, isn't it? So I kept researching and I kept digging. And actually, last year, a study came out. This study was a five-year study made by the University of Oxford. It looked at 40,000 farms in 119 countries all around the world. It's considered the most comprehensive analysis ever conducted exploring the relationship between farming and the environment. It's published in a journal called Science, which is one of the most highly regarded scientific journals in the world. And it looked at the 40 major food items that make up 90% of our global diet, both animal-based foods and plant-based foods. And one of the biggest things it looked at was land usage. Because when we talk about agriculture, land usage is one of the biggest problems associated with the environmental impact of agriculture. It said that globally, 83% of all agricultural land is given to animal agriculture. 83%, which sounds like a lot, doesn't it? But actually, just over 50% of all the crops that we grow are fed to animals anyway. And one quarter of the Earth's total usable land surface is given to grazing animals. And then of course you have the sites, the farms themselves, where the animals are contained within. And so then you see it actually racks up pretty quickly, that percentage, 83%. Now that's a Western figure as well. That's not just about, say, America or the cost Western. That's a European figure. In the UK, our Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, called DEFRA, our government body, says that between 80 to 85% of all agriculture in the UK is given to animals. That's what our government says, 80 to 85%. It's a staggering amount, isn't it? A huge amount of land given to something. But it's not really about the amount of land that's used. It's about the output that comes as a consequence of that land usage. Because if animals were providing us with that amount of sustenance, you could justify it. But of course, they're not. In fact, this five-year study said that globally, only around 39% of our protein intake comes from animals. And as little as 20% of our calorie intake comes from animal products, which means we've got a huge disparity, haven't we, between the amount of land being used and the amount of product that's been given to us as a consequence. Now, the problem with clearing land for agriculture is exactly that. It's clearing land, which means that animal agriculture globally is the leading cause of biodiversity loss because it's the leading cause of things like deforestation and habitat destruction. Because to make way for lands for farming, you have to destroy the land to make it suitable for farming to begin with, which means we destroy huge amounts of forests and woodlands to make way for agriculture. Now, the problem of destroying forests and woodlands is that trees absorb carbon through a process called photosynthesis, right? When we destroy them, that carbon gets released back into the atmosphere again. Think of all the wildfires that have been happening this year. There were wildfires in Siberia during this summer. Now, by the end of the wildfires, it was reported that those wildfires were responsible for emitting as much carbon into the atmosphere as a country like Sweden emits in an entire year. So just one of those wildfires is equal to the emissions of one westernized developed country, which is alarming, isn't it? And you think about all the other wildfires that have been taking place around the world. Now, of course, carbon in the atmosphere drives temperatures up. The higher the temperature, the risk of more droughts and more wildfires. More wildfires, more carbon. More carbon, higher temperatures. Higher temperatures, more wildfires. More wildfires, more carbon. It's a scary self-perpetuating cycle. And so what we need desperately is more trees, isn't it? More woodlands, more forestlands. And yet we've destroyed so much of it. Yes, of course, for cities and for roads, but primarily for agriculture, with over 80% of that being used for animals, which I find quite alarming. I was brought up in a place called Yorkshire, which is the north of England. Now, in Yorkshire, we're very traditional. We're very stoic. We're very proud to be where, we, where we're from. I am not. I don't like that place very much. My stepdad calls it God's Own County. God's Own County, right? That tells you about the, uh, the narcissism of Yorkshire people sometimes. We're quite nice as well, of course. But I used to get, some of us, I used to get driven around Yorkshire. And it's called the Yorkshire Dales, the, the area surrounding where I was raised. And I used to get told, look at the beauty of the Yorkshire Dales. Wow, the landscape is something to be so proud of. But actually, all the Yorkshire Dales is, is fields everywhere. 
fields as far as the eye can see with cows, cattle, sheep. That's it. We have destroyed so much land for something so needless. And not only that, but the problem is animals are one of the biggest culprits in greenhouse gas emissions. The most conservative estimate that exists is that 14.5% of all global emissions come from animal agriculture. That's the most conservative estimate. And yet that most conservative estimate still says that animal agriculture is responsible for more emissions than all the planes, cars, motorbikes, boats combined, more than all of the transportation system in the world combined. And that's the conservative estimate. So we take away something so important like natural dense vegetation, woodlands and forestlands, and we replace it with something so devastating. Animals who produce greenhouse gases take up so much of our land because they require so much food as well. And also, around 25 to one third or to 33% of all global fresh water is given to animals. Now scientists in the future say we might have wars over water. If we're having wars over water, do you think it's really responsible for us to give anywhere between a quarter to one third of all our available water to livestock animals? Something's got to give at some point. Now by 2050, there could be 10 billion humans, 10 billion humans, but also by 2050, some areas of the world won't be habitable because things like lack of food, lack of water, extreme weather conditions like typhoons, droughts, wildfires, cyclones, which means that people will be forced to move. We call them climate refugees. In the future, we're talking tens, maybe even hundreds of millions of climate refugees. And so if you have people living near to the equator who can't live there anymore and they have to move, well, where are they going to move to? The Northern Hemisphere, where land is more fertile and resources more abundant and where it's safer to live. Europe, North America but we'll have less food, less water, and more people, which means we need to be as efficient as possible with the resources that we have. So this five-year study from the University of Oxford, it said that if we shifted to a plant-based diet, we could free up the amount of agricultural land we need by 75% free quarters. That allows us to do a couple of different things. There was a study released from Harvard Law School. It's called Eating Away at Climate Emissions. And it said that if you took just one-third of the croplands in the UK that's used to feed the animals. So just 33% of the land where we grow crops to feed animals in the UK alone. You could produce enough fruits and vegetables to feed every single person in the UK their five portions of fruit and veg every single day, all year round, with just one third of the land. He said in the US, if you took all of the croplands used to feed the animals in just the US alone, you could grow enough human edible crops on that land to feed another 320 million people just with the land in the US where we grow crops to feed to animals. Amazing, amazing. But also, there's something else we could do with this land if we had it spare. We could do something called rewilding. I think rewilding is such an exciting prospect. Rewilding is, is Inherently, as it sounds, you allow the land to return to its natural state or as much as it can possibly return. I use the word natural, of course, rather loosely. But return it to its state of which it used to look like. And so for us living in places like Germany or the UK, that's forests, that's woodlands, that's even temperate rainforests. Because temperate rainforests can be found across Europe. Restore that land. You can do a couple of different things. Firstly, more trees, more woods. We can sequester the carbon from the atmosphere, take some of that carbon out, which is desperately what we need to do. We need less carbon in the atmosphere. So let's make healthy woodlands and forestlands and healthy soils that can do exactly that. We can also do something called trophic rewilding, which is where we introduce animals, natural animals, back into those landscapes. Because indigenous animals have always played a fundamental role in maintaining the ecology of where they're found. For instance, in America, Someone bought out a cattle ranch. I think it was in Montana, although I might be wrong. And all the cattle were gone. And instead, he introduced or trophically rewilded a herd of bison because bison are indigenous to many areas in the United States. And so he doesn't kill the bison. They're not there to be farmed and to be killed. They're there because they help balance the ecology of the area. Now, bison, their hooves are like scissors. So when they walk through the grass, they cut the grass. And through cutting the grass, encourages carbon to be sequestered into the soil, which is amazing, wonderful. So we can trophically rewild, put animals back into these landscapes, and all of a sudden we're helping balance the ecology even more. And even more excitingly, you have something called 
forest farms. Because of course, natural vegetation produces food on its own. Farmers can rewild their land. We can encourage them to do that through subsidies. And also they can sell the produce that's grown in the forests they have to a localized community, thus reducing the amount of food that we import from other countries as well. There's so much we can do. I find it exhilarating. But one thing's gotta give because Sometimes people say to me, but how can we feed everyone on a vegan diet in the world? But really the question should be flipped. And it should be, well, how can we feed everyone in the world on an animal-based diet? When they take up so many resources and our world as a population is growing constantly. Right now, animal agriculture takes up 45% of the Earth's total ice-free land. Right now, currently. But we're going to have another 2 billion people in 30 years and less land available to us. It's not feasible for us to continue this way. Something has to change. This five-year study, the most comprehensive ever conducted on the matter, concluded by saying the single biggest thing that we can do as individuals is to adopt a vegan lifestyle. The single biggest thing. Now, of course, as a society, as cultures, we have to demand change from our governments, but we also have to work in tandem to change together as individuals as well. Because this fight against climate change isn't something that's going to be resolved by just asking others to do the hard work. It requires us to do things as well within our own life. And as individuals, the biggest thing that we can do is change what we eat, take out the animals and replace them with plants. That's the most fundamentally powerful thing that we can do to impact our planet in a positive way. Now, climate change is a social justice issue. What I mean by that is that currently, and it will continue to do so, it affects those who have done least to cause it the most severely which means it's a human rights issue, an animal rights issue, as well as a planetary issue. It's existential in threat and in size, but we can do something about it every single day by looking at our individual actions. And I think that's empowering because often we feel helpless, don't we? We look at famine, we look at Ebola crises or health crises around the world, we look at war, and we feel like we can't make a positive impact. We can't do anything substantial. But what we consume every single day is something we have full control over. We have autonomy, self-control to make those decisions. And thus, the consequence of veganism, the positive consequence, is something that has to be discussed even more ferociously because it is something we have direct control over. The reality is, to talk about climate change without mentioning animal agriculture is to talk about lung cancer and not mention smoking. The two are fundamentally and intrinsically linked to one another. And so we have to have those conversations. And if we're being told that it's something that we can actually manage, mitigate by looking at our plates, then it has to be a conversation to be had. Let's move it on. Let's move it on. Because it's bigger than just that, of course. It's bigger than just the environment. It's bigger than just looking at climate change. It's bigger than that. The responsibility we have as individuals far surpasses just the positive benefits that we can have on our environment. The environment aside, there's something more intrinsically linked to veganism, isn't there? Which is the ethical, moral foundation of the way that we live. Now, I've been having conversations about veganism with people for quite some time. And there's always a selection of similar things that are said to me. And one of the first things that's said to me, and I quite like this one, is people say, I really respect you for being vegan. I, I think it's great. You know, I, I love that we live in a world where you can make that choice. I think that's wonderful. And I actually think that it's really, really wonderful of you to actually respect me as well. Because I'm respecting you and the choice that you've made. So I just ask that you respect my choice to not be vegan. After all, it is a personal choice. And I don't like it when vegans try and force their views, right? I think that's quite interesting. And I actually agree with part of that because it is a personal choice, isn't it? What we choose to consume is entirely up to us. We can go into Lidl or Aldi and we can buy a steak, we can buy chicken breast, we can buy salmon, we can buy tuna, we can buy lamb, we can buy chickpeas, we can buy black beans, we can buy tofu, we can buy a vegan meat substitute. We've got a whole spectrum of choice, right? But then the question is, well, should something be considered acceptable simply because it's something we have a choice over? What I really mean by that is every decision we make is a personal choice, isn't it? Every choice, you decided to come tonight, that was a personal choice, unless your vegan partner's dragged you here, in which case maybe it wasn't, right? <laughs> I know there's a few people out there probably, right? But everything we do fundamentally is a personal choice. So let's say, for example, I leave tonight and I'm thinking to myself, I'm a little bit low on cash, right? So I'm gonna go and I'm gonna mug someone. I'm gonna take their wallet off them, right? I've personally chosen to do that. Now there's a glaring difference, isn't there? 
Mugging someone is obviously illegal. It's a criminal offence. But buying a steak from Aldi is legal, so there's a big difference there. But then the question becomes, well, does legality equal morality? You know? Is something considered acceptable just because the law says it is? We can look throughout history, can't we, and think of many situations, many industries, many actions, many behaviours, many things we used to do that were legally allowed, but were certainly not moral. Right? And in fact, if we, if we apply that notion that legality equals morality, that means that the legal systems in every individual country would be moral as a result. But we look around the world, and we see many things that happen that are legally allowed, but morally are abhorrent. Legality should equal morality, but it doesn't and it never has. Now, personal choice, therefore, doesn't mean that it's simply morally justified because we have that personal choice. And actually, I think that every belief system, every philosophical foundation, every religion, every ideology, every lifestyle should be challenged and scrutinized, especially those ones that are so ingrained that we just consider them to be normal. Everything should be challenged and scrutinized. We should always dig deeper because by digging deeper, we actually discover how we feel about certain things. Just blindly accept something because we've always done it and people around us do it is so dangerous. So, so dangerous. And so I think we should scrutinize everything, veganism included in that. Challenge every lifestyle, philosophy, religion, belief system. Because I think to do that is to show a great sign of respect. To ask each other difficult questions about the way that we live is ultimately very respectful. Because it's to say, I believe that you have the intellectual and emotional maturity to be able to question yourself, even if doing so is uncomfortable and not very pleasant. I think it shows a great deal of respect for us to look at each other and have polite conversations where we dig deeper about things that we just commonly accept as being normal. Okay. And what about forcing views? Now, I couldn't do this even if I wanted to, and I definitely don't want to, but I cannot follow you all home tonight, right? I can't make you go into a supermarket, make you buy some tofu, make you take it home, make you cook it, watch you eat it, and then say, told you it's not that bad, right? <laughs> and all this, it's not, it's not. It's, some tofu is terrible. Some of it's great, right? Like, okay, I'll accept that one. I can't do that. But when you leave today, what you do from this point on is entirely up to you. You have that choice. But think about this. Let's say we buy a steak from a supermarket. When we buy that steak, we demand that an animal have their throat cut and be killed. What could be more forceful than making someone have their life taken from them, for our belief, the belief that meat tastes nice and so I want to eat it? What could be more forceful than that? Vegans can be preachy, that's for sure. They can be militant, they can be loud, but they can never force you to live differently. But when we buy products, we do force things to happen to others. And for those animals, it's a life mostly of suffering and pain, but ultimately always death. What could be more forceful than that? Taste, right? It's the big one, isn't it? People always say to me, look, Ed, right? I think it's great you're vegan, but like, I just really like steak and cheese. Cheese, everyone loves cheese, don't they? And everyone tells me, Ed, I could never go vegan. I just love the taste of cheese too much, right? Then it's like, you must have never liked cheese because if, you couldn't give it up if you liked it. I'm like, well, here's the thing, right? I've never met a vegan to this day, right? Who when asked the question, hey, you know, why are you vegan? They say, well, to be honest, I thought bacon, steak, cheese, fried chicken, Domino's pizza, I thought they were disgusting, right? I've never met that person. I don't think that person exists. The reason that we change and go vegan isn't because we stop enjoying how these things taste. We create some sort of scale in our head, right? Some sort of imaginary scale. And on one side, we place taste, right? Because that's the justification, taste. And on the other side, we place life. Because when we eat these products, the consequence is that someone's life is taken. Even for dairy and eggs, lives are, are taken for those products. And so that's the question, isn't it? What has high value, taste or life? That was life for me. But some people, some people say taste. But when we say taste, what we're actually saying is that sensory pleasure provides a moral justification for our actions because taste is a sense. I like how it tastes. It provides my sense with pleasure. But if we apply our moral arguments, they have to be applied somewhat consistently into different environments. And so for that one, it's quite simple, isn't it? We say, can we think of any situations, any actions, any behaviors where someone feels sensory pleasure at the expense of someone else? We can think of many. And then we say, is that action justified simply because someone feels sensory pleasure? And we say, well, of course not. What does that matter? What matters is, is the victim. 
But how come when the animals are the victims and we're the oppressor in this environment, why does it not matter then? Why can we justify it by saying, well, I don't care what happens to them because I like how they taste. Why does that justify all these things when we don't apply that way of thinking to any other situation in our life? It's slightly disingenuous. We reach a point where we live in a state of contradictory notion, don't we? Where we use one argument to justify one thing, but we can't apply it to other areas where it could also be used to justify what happens. Now, sometimes people say to me, they say, Ed, this vegan thing, right? It's gone too far, it's gone too far, right? I'll go vegan the day that you convince a lion to go vegan, right? Because lions are animals, and I'm an animal, and so if lions can eat meat, well then so can I, right? It's true, lions of course eat meat, they eat zebras, they eat gazelles. They do so because they're obligate carnivores, meaning they have to to survive. We don't have that excuse. But moreover, why would we base our morality on the actions of wild animals? That seems slightly farcical to me. Lions of course kill each other. Imagine if uh, someone murdered another human and they went to court and the judge said, what's your defense? They said, well, lions kill other lions, right? And lions are animals and I'm an animal, so if they can kill each other, then so can I, right? And the judge goes, case dismissed, right? Off you go, right? you're free. <laughs> nonsense, nonsense, right? Because we don't base our morality and values on the actions of wild animals. That's dangerous. So again, we can't use lions as a role model for how we should live in a contemporary, quote unquote, civilized society. But then sometimes people say, they say, Ed, you're very ungrateful because you wouldn't be alive today if your ancestors didn't eat meat. Your ancestors were hunters as well as gatherers. And so if they didn't hunt, well, you wouldn't have been born. Very true. My ancestors did hunt as well as gather. And it was probably instrumental to me being born today that they did. But again, my ancestors did a whole host of terrible things that I would never want to allow in a modern society. Why would we base our actions on the, the behaviors of primitive Neanderthals who obviously did a whole host of different things? We've evolved so much as, as a society, we can't transgress to our past to look towards what we should do in the future. Moreover, right, there was a plane crash in the Andes in the 1970s. Survivors of the plane crash survived because they cannibalized on the passengers who had died. In that moment, we'd say that cannibalism was a morally justifiable act. I have no problem with it in that scenario. But we wouldn't say that cannibalism was a justifiable act in everyday society. Same way I feel that if we have to eat animals for our survival, you can justify that act. But in our world, where we live, Germany, the UK, we don't have to do it. And so it becomes very difficult to justify something when it's needless in that sense. So we move on a little bit further and we keep digging a little bit deeper. Now, of course, as humans, we are intellectually dominant, physically dominant as well in terms of what we can do. Now, intellectual and physical dominance really gives you two options, doesn't it? The first option is you can have like a might makes right approach. What I mean by that is you use your dominance to impose some sort of authoritarian rule over others. I don't think for a second we can deny that what we've chosen so far is a form of authoritarianism over these animals. We literally breed them into existence when we want them. We assign them an ear tag with a numerical value. So we deny them of their personality, of their individualism. We take away any right to be acknowledged as a sentient being, and instead we refer to them as commodities, its, livestock. I mean, the term livestock is interesting in itself. You go to a supermarket, the shelves are full of stock. These animals we refer to as livestock, shelf stock that just happens to be alive and such an inconvenience that we have to kill them, right? We deny them the right to be acknowledged as autonomous beings. We take away their autonomy from them. Couldn't be more authoritarian. We mutilate them, forcibly impregnate them, take their babies away from them, exploit them, and then ultimately take their life from them when we want. Every action, every part of their life is dictated to them by us. It couldn't be more authoritarian than that. But we have another option, of course. With that intellectual and physical dominance, we can do something else, can't we? That is, we can act somewhat as stewards for the world. Now, I'm not trying to be childish and naive. I'm not saying that by being stewards, we have to run around and skip down the road with pigs and cows and cuddle in these rewilded forests, right? That's not what I'm saying. To be a steward doesn't mean you have to do anything for this planet other than, well, or for the animals, other than just not hurt them. Like being vegan is the ultimate passive action in that sense, because it requires you to not do something to someone, whereas to be non-vegan is an active action. It requires you to harm others for the way that you live. And so actually being a steward for this planet doesn't mean we have to do anything extreme or radical. We do the opposite. We stop doing something that we should consider as being extreme, because we kill 75 billion land animals every single year. 
An estimate says somewhere between one and 2.7 trillion marine animals every single year. And for what? Because we like how they taste? Because we've always done it? Because it's convenient? Because it's habit? But the destruction and suffering those actions cause should be considered extreme when we live in a world where, where we have alternatives and abundance of other options that we can choose. That's what I think. Sometimes people call vegans extreme. Sometimes when I talk about the environment, people say, but you know, going vegan still seems a bit extreme to me for the environment. And that's because climate change isn't necessarily tangible and the suffering of animals isn't directly in front of us. And so we can kind of take a step back. Those degrees of separation allow us to detach from the action. But the increasing proximity of climate change will also decrease the idea that veganism is extreme pretty quick. The more we feel the heat, so to speak, of climate change, the quicker we'll think, actually, you know what, that tofu sounds quite nice right about now, you know? <laughs> That'll reach that point where we cross over. And I think that's really important to note. That notion of what we consider to be radical and extreme in a modern world is potentially slightly paradoxical when you look at the damage of what the supposedly normal way of life actually causes in the end. Now, I want to talk really briefly. Are we talking? I've got another 10 minutes or so. Okay, we're good. Sometimes I talk and talk, I look at the time, I'm like, oh my God, right? How do we get here? Right? I've got a bit more time. We buy things in supermarkets that have nice labels on them, don't we? Nice labels. Things like free range eggs are pretty, pretty enticing, aren't they? But one thing that we often hear is the word humane, right? Often people say to me, look, Ed, I actually agree with you, right? I think halal and kosher slaughter is barbaric. I can't believe that we still do religious slaughter in this way where the animals just have their throats cut. That's disgusting, which is why I buy animals who have been killed humanely. All right? That's interesting, isn't it? We apply the word humane next to the action slaughter, but we have to define what the word humane means. Now, let's open up an imaginary thesaurus, right? Find, find the word humane. Now, the other words that go with the word humane will be things like compassion, benevolence, kindness. So if we use the word humane next to the action slaughter, we have to use the word compassion or benevolence or kindness. And so really the question is, how do you compassionately or benevolently take the life of someone who doesn't have to die and who doesn't want to die? What I mean by that is animals don't willfully walk onto the kill floor of a slaughterhouse. They don't present their throat for the slaughterman to cut it. They're forced there against their will. And so we refer to something as being humane when it's non-consensual, needless, and results in death. Now to me, the act of taking someone's life for no reason could be the opposite of compassionate or benevolent or kind, and therefore must be the opposite of humane as well. And so humane slaughter is an oxymoron. What I mean by that is the two words contradict each other. It's a lie within a phrase. It doesn't exist. Now also let's bear in mind that the humane way to kill pigs across the European Union is in a gas chamber where two or three pigs are loaded into a metal cage that's dropped into an abyss that's filled with CO2. The aversive mixture of CO2 suffocates them for about 30 seconds until they die, but it also burns the moisture behind their eyes and in their throats, causing them to scream as they die. And you can watch this online. It's not pleasant, but it's there and it happens. We call that humane or compassionate or benevolent because they get to die together. Wow, what a mercy, right? Because normally with pigs, we electrically stun them and then hang them upside down and cut their throats. But this time, they get to die in twos or threes, and we call that compassionate. So when we use the word humane, that's what we're actually using the word humane for, gassing animals to death. It doesn't sound like compassion to me to do that to someone, a sentient being. Now, another thing that often we hear is about the dairy industry, isn't it? In the UK, there's a supermarket called Tesco. I actually really like Tesco. I'm a big fan of Tesco. They just released an advert, which was really powerful on the TV, about a, a young girl who wants to stop eating animals. But also, they do a lot of good vegan food. I quite like that. I'm into vegan food, as you can tell, right? But Tesco's also do this thing down every dairy aisle. First of all, it says 100% British, which I think is absolutely nonsensical, isn't it? It's like, oh, great, we exploit animals in our country, so hey, everything's amazing, right? But also, I'll hold on to that idea. But also, we say happy cows produce happy milk, right? Well, first of all, it's happy milk, right? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work out this, this milk that's full of emotion, that's just like bursting out of the udders, like so pleased to see daylight. It can't believe it's luck, right? Happy milk, right? But you see that and it reassures you, right? Happy cows produce, that sounds wonderful. I would love to pay for a cow to be happy. That's incredible. That's what you read. But actually, what does that mean? 
what, what does that actually look like? Now, in the UK, we're rated A for welfare. I mentioned that 100% British thing, because in Britain, we are so proud of the way we treat animals. You know what we do in Britain? We go, look at America. Oh, chlorinated chicken. That's disgusting, the way they treat animals. Look at China. Oh, I can't believe how terrible it is in China. They're barbaric to animals in China. Or oh, Russia. Oof. Bloody hell, Russia's bad, isn't it, for animals? But not in the UK. Oh, we treat our animals so good here. They're actually privileged to be born here, right? That's what we say. I know it's the same in Germany because I've had people say it to me, but we treat our animals different here. If something bad was happening, the government would step in. We have laws to protect animals, right? Abuse is very uncommon. If it happens, the farms get shut down, right? We don't abuse animals because we have laws protecting animals. That's what we're told. Okay, the UK is rated A for animal welfare, which actually means our arrogance is somewhat legitimate because only the UK, New Zealand, Austria, and Switzerland are rated A for animal welfare, which means that nobody does it as good as we do, right? Germany is rated B. Oh, come on, guys. B, really? A here, right. But what does that actually look like? A, the dairy industry. Everything I describe now is standard legal practice. This is so important. Standard legal industry-wide practice in an A rated welfare scheme. This is how it's done the best of the best. Now, dairy cows are mammals, right? Which means they only produce milk to feed their children. Now, I used to think that cows ate grass and then out came milk, right? You see cows grazing, you think, that's, a bit, that's amazing, right? But actually, that's not true, of course. Cows are mammals. They have to give birth to lactate, which means that dairy farmers will artificially inseminate dairy cows every single year, more or less. This is first done, of course, by acquiring bull semen, because you need semen to impregnate. And now think about how that's done. Think of how someone gets semen from a bull. You're absolutely right. That's how it's done. And it's really, really weird, isn't it? How creepy is that? Imagine if you saw someone doing that to an animal, right? That should be illegal to do that. In fact, it is. We call it bestiality, which is technically illegal. But when someone gets paid to do it, all of a sudden it's fine? No. It's really, really weird. And now they've got the semen from the bull. They take it to the dairy farm. They have to put it inside the cow, of course. And so they restrain the cow in like a metal cage. These metal cages are used for things like vaccines, you know, antibiotics, for something like bovine TB jabs to see if the animals are, are ill. And they're also used for the insemination process. So the cows are restrained. The farmer then places his arm inside the anus of the dairy cow. He'll hold her cervix in place through the lining of the anus. He then takes the bull semen, injects the bull semen through her vagina and into her cervix. So we pay farmers and people to take semen from a bull and also to penetrate female cows as well, or cows. Now the cow's gestation is about nine months, similar to that of a human's. And now once she gives birth, the calf only needs the first feed from their mother. The first feed has something called colostrum in it, which is full of antibodies. The antibodies are essential to the calf's health. But once the calf's had the first feed, any more milk that's taken from the mother is a waste of milk, right? Because cows produce milk for us to drink, right? And so if the baby's drinking their mother's milk, then that doesn't make sense, right? Because the whole thing is, we drink our mother's milk, we wean off our mother, and then we wean onto someone else's mother. It just happens that this someone else's mother is for an entirely different species, and we're weaned onto this other species' breast for about 60 or 70 years, right? That sounds right, doesn't it? It doesn't sound weird at all. Sometimes I say to people, let's say you're going past a field with a dairy herd. Did you ever get thirsty? Did you ever just pull over, go on, you know what? Milk's a little bit expensive sometimes in the supermarket. I can get some free milk right now. Just have a little drink. No, strange. Now what about, let's say, if you were driving past a dairy, a dairy herd and you saw someone else underneath the cows drinking from them. What would you think about that? I would think that was really weird. But what is the difference? We buy it in a supermarket, it comes in a bottle, but you might as well just get it from the cow yourself because you're paying someone else to do that process. Save yourself some money, go have a drink yourself from the fountain, right? No, that's so weird. We wouldn't want to do that, right? Okay, so the cow gives birth, the calf has the first feed, and then the baby is taken away from the mother because the more calf, the more milk the calf drinks, the less milk the farmer can sell. So the calf in an A-rated welfare scheme will be taken to something we call a solitary confinement hutch. These are hutches that are maybe two meters long, one and a half meters wide. A farmer can legally house the newborn calf in that hutch for the first eight weeks of their life. 
first eight weeks, that's obviously nothing from their mother, no maternal love or feeding. There's no exercise. There's no companionship. Now, calves are basically big dogs. They like to run and jump and play. And we confine them in a small hutch for the first eight weeks of their life legally, right? Now, the males are useless to the dairy industry, producing milk as a female reproductive process, of course. And so the males will make no money for the dairy herds or for the dairy farmers. And so a few things could happen. Sometimes they're raised and killed for veal. The veal market's not too substantially big anymore. Sometimes they're sold into the beef herds and we raised for their flesh. But the calves born into the dairy industry are a different breed to the calves born into the beef industry, which means that actually for many farmers, it's not profitable for them to raise the calf up. And so one of the cheapest things that they can do, one of the best things for profits, is to shoot the newborn calves. In the UK, 90,000 male dairy calves are shot in the head almost immediately after birth because there's no money in keeping them alive, right? The mothers will be hooked up to milking machines two or three times a day, pretty much every single day. After about four to six years, depending, they are taken to a slaughterhouse where they have a bolt put in their head and a knife pulled across their throat. Remember that we can call them happy cows. We can say happy cows produce happy milk, but that's what the process looks like, standard legal practice in an A-rated welfare scheme, the best in the world. And then we call these cows happy. Do you know what makes me really angry, actually? Right now in the European Union, there's a debate going on about whether or not you can call things like oat milk milk or vegan burgers burgers. I think in Germany, you, you can't call oat milk milk anyway already, right? And they say the reason for that is because it's misleading to the consumer, right? So the big old European Union's got to come and help us because we're so stupid, right? We walk into Lidl and we see something that says oat milk and we go, oat, milk, milk, oat, right? And because we're, we're so, we're so you know, the, the general public, the consumers, we're so stupid. We buy it because we see the word milk and we're so dumb, right? So we take it home and we pour it on our cereal and we start eating it and we go, this isn't milk, <laughs> right? Vegans, damn. If only someone could come and protect us from all this misleading labeling that's going on, right? So don't worry, the European Union is going to help us. They're going to ban us from saying that milk can be called milk if it's made from oats or that a burger can be called a burger if it's made from mushrooms because we're so silly. But don't you think it's crazy, right? It's misleading for the consumers to say that oat milk is milk. But do you know what's not misleading for the consumers? To say that cows are happy when we take their babies away from them. To say that cows are happy when we bolt them in the head and hang them upside down to cut their throat. That's not misleading. That's fine. Don't worry about that. These cows are happy. We're just forcibly impregnating them and exploiting them. Oat milk, though, oh, what a travesty that is, right? It is so insane, the system that we live in, that this is what has been debated right now, whilst millions, billions of animals are being exploited and we refer to them as happy, or we kill them in gas chambers and say it's humane, and that's fine, right? That's not misleading at all. We look at free-range hens, don't we? Now, I used to buy free-range eggs because I thought that meant the hens lived a good life. In fact, even before I was vegetarian, and I had bacon and steak and cow's milk and chicken and everything in my basket, if I saw anyone with caged eggs, I thought that they were a monster. I was like, who could be so cruel to animals? You're buying caged eggs? How dare you? I thought it was a horrible thing because I thought the difference was maybe 50, 60 cents or whatever between caged eggs and free range, meaning between enslavement and freedom. We see a box of free range eggs, we put our ideals of freedom onto that box of eggs. Now freedom to us means living the life that we want to live. It means doing the things that come naturally to us, whatever that means, the things that we want. But it means living a life without pain, suffering, fear, and exploitation. We see that box, box of free range eggs, we see those hens must have lived a good life. They must have done the things that come naturally to them. They must have lived without pain, suffering, fear, and exploitation. But is that actually true? Now, free-range hens are born in hatcheries, as all egg-laying hens are, caged, free-range, or organic. They're all born in hatcheries. Also, males are born in hatcheries as well. Males are useless to the egg industry because producing eggs is a female reproductive process. They're also not the same type of chicken that we raise for meat. The chickens that we raise for meat, that we call broilers, have been raised to reach slaughter age in just 41 days. They've been selectively bred that way. They reach slaughter age so quickly that they die from organ failure. Their hearts give out. They can't support their weight on their legs. And millions every single year die on their backs from starvation and thirst because they can't walk and reach food and water points. The male chicks in the egg industry, that won't happen to them. So they're completely useless. There's no money in there for them. 
And so every single year around the world, tens of billions, probably actually hundreds of billions of these animals are killed almost immediately, as soon as they're born, by being thrown in a macerator, which grinds them up alive, or into a gas chamber, where they're gassed to death. Again, males killed because there's no money in keeping them alive. The free-range hens will be de-beaked. They'll have their beaks cut off so they can't peck at each other. They're then taken to the barns. Now, in the UK, a free-range egg farmer can legally house 16,000 birds per barn, which means he can legally house nine birds per square metre of space. Per square metre. Nine birds. Free-range, right? Now, of course, I have to be honest. They have to have an outside area, but many of the hens won't reach the outside area because of the way the pecking orders exist and the size of the barns. But anyway, nine birds per square metre of space. That's what we call free range. Now, egg-laying hens produce eggs for about 72 weeks of their life, a year and a half, 18 months. At that point, their egg production starts to decline. There's no money in keeping them alive anymore because they're not producing enough eggs. So they're all taken to a slaughterhouse where they're shackled by their feet, dragged from an electrified water bath, and then over a rotating blade before into the scalding tanks where they're boiled. Free range, freedom. That's what we constitute as being free. 72 weeks of life in a barn where they can be legally housed, nine of them per square meter of space, to then ultimately be killed by being hung upside down and having a blade pulled across their throat. Free range. Again, these labels are there to fool us into buying something that if we knew the truth about, we'd probably think differently. Let's say we're buying some bacon. And instead of saying high welfare bacon, all right, it says this bacon comes from a pig who screamed in a gas chamber as they were killed. We'd probably go, oh, tofu doesn't sound that weird anymore, right? Yeah. Or cheese is a good one, isn't it? Because vegan cheese is often seen as being weird, right? But let's say that you buy this camembert, and it says this camembert came from a mother cow whose baby was taken away from her, who actually came from an animal who was penetrated by the farmer, and is now in a slaughterhouse about to have their throat cut. All of a sudden, vegan cheese doesn't sound that weird, does it? Not to me anyway. Coconut oil? I'm, I'm, I'm okay with coconut oil and cheese, actually. But what I'm not okay with is huge amounts of suffering and exploitation. Because if the color of milk actually reflected what the industry looked like, it would be red, tainted by the blood and the suffering of the animals who were killed, the infanticide of all these babies who were killed simply because there's no money keeping them alive. Okay, let me finish it here. We eat a meal, right? One meal, three meals a day. Those meals last about 15 minutes each, right? We'll probably go get some dinner after this. We had some lunch earlier today. Lunch, actually, sometimes we eat very quickly. Grab and go, don't we? Buy a sandwich, maybe it's a chicken sandwich. We eat it in a few minutes. We've got to get back to work. And we eat that really quick. Let's say 15 minutes is the average, okay? 15 minutes for a meal, but that meal could have cost someone their entire life, right? Their life taken from them. Their one existence gone for something we eat and then move on. Forget about. I could say, what did you have for lunch six days ago? What did you have for dinner 12 days ago? Off the top of your head, probably not much of an idea, right? But that lunch and that dinner could have paid for someone or will pay for someone else in the future to live a life of suffering where they're mutilated and then killed. Their life gone for 15 minutes. That's it. All of that suffering, for what? For that? For that sandwich? that we eat and then just move on with? How do we justify that? That's the question I often try and keep coming back to. How do we justify what we do to others? How do we justify living in a system where 75 billion land animals are killed every single year, up to 2.7 trillion marine animals, not to mention the environmental degradation that's caused by the industry, and we're told the single biggest thing that we can do as individuals to mitigate or reduce our impacts on the environment is to go vegan. So how do we justify not doing it then? Considering everything that happens when we buy these products, everything that happens from the whole chain of command that leads up to us eating it, 15 minutes, everything that comes before it, consume, and then we move on. I asked that question, didn't I, of taste or life earlier? It's actually not a very fair question. Because when you go vegan, you're not even really giving up taste. There are some products you can't always get great vegan versions of, but for the most part, we have vegan versions of almost anything now. Burgers, of course, sausages. That Beyond Meat Bratwurst is crazy, right? It's so good. So actually, it's not really a question of taste or life. It's a question of taste or life and taste from a different source, a plant-based source, because that's really what's at stake here. Going vegan doesn't mean you have to give anything up, not even taste. 
You just change where you get those flavors and that satisfaction from. And so what do we have to lose from trying it? That's always a question, isn't it? Why not give it a go? What do we have to lose? Because we have so much to gain. Or importantly, through us changing, others have so much to gain as well. And so maybe we say to ourselves, well, how do I justify this? You know, what moral justification can I use? I acknowledge it's habitual, but that shouldn't really matter. I acknowledge that I've always done it and those before me have always done it. But what difference does that make when we look towards the future? I acknowledge it tastes nice, but my taste isn't worth more than the animal's life and, of course, the suffering they're forced to endure. Yes, animals eat other animals, but they do so out of necessity. But I don't do that. So why do I do what I do? And if I can't think of a good enough reason to justify that, then well, actually maybe I have to say to myself, do I have to make a change? Yes, for myself and for aligning my morals with my actions, but also for others, those humans who have been negatively impacted by climate change, my children and grandchildren, but of course all those animals as well. Okay, let's finish it there. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate your time. The question is, can I comment on how healthy or unhealthy a vegan diet is? I can comment, yes. Um, what, what, what I would say, right, is um, there's, there's a couple of ways of looking at this, isn't there? A lot of, sometimes people say to me, look, Ed, well, you, you do this big talk, right, and you don't talk about, like, the health benefits of going vegan, you know, like how it reduces heart disease, type 2 diabetes, how you can be a strength athlete, like we've seen in movies like The Game Changers on, on Netflix. Why, why don't you talk about that? Um, f for me, I don't talk about that really because I, I, I don't think it's necessary to the conversation about why we should be vegan. But the, the foundation of what we have to, to understand or, or to learn really is we're not being plant-based is nutritionally adequate for us to live. And, and if that's it, then anything positive is really just a bonus, but it shouldn't define whether or not we're enticed by being vegan. But let, let, let's start right at the bottom and start with the bare minimum and then we can work our way up, can't we? The American Dietetic Association and the British Dietetic Association, um, the American Dietetic Association, by the way, is the largest body of diet and nutrition professionals in the world. It's made up of 100,000 dietitians, nutritionists, and doctors. So that organization, the British equivalent, the NHS, uh, Canadian as well, I think, a whole bunch anyway, have categorically stated that a plant-based diet is nutritionally adequate, healthy, and safe for all stages of life, including when we're pregnant, when we give birth, when we're lactating, when we're children, all stages of life. That seems challenging, doesn't it? Because I know in Europe in particular, there's a bit of a conversation, isn't there, about vegan children, right? And, and, and actually, it happened because some, uh, a child who was vegan died. Everyone goes, oh my goodness, a vegan child died. Well, this obviously proves that veganism is terrible for children. Well, actually, no, no, all it proves, unfortunately, is that someone can be vegan and still be an abusive parent, right? That's fundamentally what it shows, because that child was malnourished and abused. And so all it means is that that's the case. Non-vegan children die from being malnourished because of abusive parents, and no one says, well, meat's the problem. The eggs were the problem. It happens to one vegan child, and it's veganism that's the problem. It, it, it's not seeing the wood through the trees. It's a selective bias, right? But when we look at the science, nutritionally adequate, healthy, and safe for all stages of life. So that's really the bare minimum, isn't it? I, I need to be really frank, actually, and say, well, actually, we should all take a vitamin D supplement during winter. Every single one of us living in Europe. Vegan, non-vegan, pescatarian, reduced vegetarian, vegetarian, it doesn't matter what you eat. Take a vitamin D supplement because we don't get enough sunshine and the majority of the people in the world who live where we live are vitamin D deficient. And it is instrumental to our body, to our mental health. Take a vitamin D supplement, right? We all should. But the other thing on a vegan diet really is about B12, isn't it? That's the one that comes up a lot. Vitamin B12, vitamin B12. B12 is a microbe that's grown in soil. When animals graze, they ingest B12. When we were hunter-gatherers, we got B12 from animals. We also got it from plants because plants grow in soil, a lot of them anyway. And so when we ate the plants, we get B12 from plants as well. It came from both sources. In a modern agricultural system, our plants are sanitized, washed, and cleaned, and so there's no B12 in plants anymore. But also, over 90% of worldwide B12 supplements are sold into the livestock industry. Most of the animals we consume are supplemented with B12 because they're also fed agricultural food that's sanitized, cleaned, processed, and therefore there's no B12 in their diet either. So the majority of the B12 that we get from animals comes from a supplement anyway. Now, of course, if you buy grass-fed pasture-raised beef, for example, there will be B12 in that naturally. That's absolutely fine to recognize, of course. That doesn't justify what we do to animals. And plus, a pasture-raised, grass-fed system environmentally is the absolute worst. 
animals take up more land, they produce more greenhouse gases because they take longer to reach slaughter age, and also you get less supply at the end. And so even if we switch to an entirely grass-fed food system because we want natural B12, most people wouldn't be able to get it anyway because the supply would decrease so much, the price would skyrocket, meaning only the rich people could afford it to begin with. And so whichever way we look at it in the world that we live in, we're going to get B12 from a few different places, but most of the time we're not going to get it in its natural state for most people, right? And so there's a few things you can do. Eat fortified B12, uh, eat fortified plant foods that have B12 fortified in them. What a terrible way of wording that. What I mean by that is plant milks, yogurts, vegan cheeses, vegan meats, different things like that. Nutritional yeast, which by the way is great. Nutritional yeast, you think that sounds disgusting, right? Nutritional, what the hell is that? They could give it a, a sexier name, that's for sure. But nutritional yeast, right? It's delicious, it's really good. B12, right? Amazing. Um, so eat fortified B12 foods or take a weekly supplement because you can either get your B12 through animal who's been supplemented or you can take the supplement yourself. I think in the US, 40% of people are B12 deficient. Your 40% of the population of the US is not vegan. So it suggests there's something else at play here. So just be aware of that. So in terms of like the nutritional safety of it, it's scientifically sound. All it takes is a little bit of personal responsibility. What I like about being vegan is people tell me I'm going to be sick and malnourished and ill and going to die really young because I'm vegan. I'm not going to get all these nutrients, right? And so what that actually encouraged me to do is look everything up, become more well-researched about nutrients and track what I eat. And so before I was vegan, I used to eat crap. And I was probably deficient in about a dozen different vitamins. But no one said to me, Ed, you're eating Domino's pizza every night. Aren't you worried about your B12? Right? No one said that to me. I go vegan and I'm eating loads of different foods. They go, Ed, you're eating the whole foods plant-based diet. Aren't you worried about your B12? Like, no, not anymore. I'm not. I should have been worried about it 10 years ago, right? But I'm not anymore. So I think what I like about veganism is it encourages us to be more aware of what we're eating. And so do take personal responsibility, learn where you get your nutrients from, eat a varied diet, and keep track of it. There's a thing called chronometer. You put in the food you eat, the amounts you eat, and it tells you the nutritional value of your diet. It's great if you wanna go vegan. At the beginning, track your food for like eight weeks, then you know if you're hitting everything you need to hit. And then you're safe, and you're sound, and you're good to go. So that's what I say. Scientifically, bare minimum, it's sound. But actually, if you dig deeper, look at what Harvard Medical School is saying, for example, look at what Cornell researchers are saying, for example, look at what's coming out from Oxford as an example, and look at the United Nations, look at the World Health Organization, you see something better than just the minimum. What you see is actually that a plant-based diet can fight and combat many of our leading diseases and illnesses. Heart disease and type two diabetes can be reversed through a plant-based diet. The only diet in the world that can reverse those two things and stop them from coming back if we eat a whole foods plant-based diet. And so there's a lot of research out there. There's a group called the NFI. They've just done a massive thing. They've been published in Slovakia's biggest newspaper because in less than a year, they have 4,000 patients who are type 2 diabetic and they have over a 90% rate of reversing their type 2 diabetes when they follow this plant-based NFI protocol, right? Science is, 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 is good. It's really, really good. But that's not the point. All we have to acknowledge is that being vegan is enough. The fact that it's more than enough doesn't really matter. The fact that it is enough is what matters to the conversation of why we should be vegan or should we be vegan? Because everything after that is just bonuses, which is great, you know? So, yes. But as with everything, do some research, take some personal responsibility for your own health, be aware that you could be a healthy vegan and you could definitely be an unhealthy vegan. I love Beyond Burgers. I think they're amazing, but please do not eat them every day. <laughs> just don't do that, like, please don't. Like, so there's a lot of vegan foods that are great, but they're not always healthy, so, you know, Enjoy yourself, but also be healthy as well, if you want to. If you want to be. There's no pressure. Eat crap if you want. I don't. We, I, what I want, the, the reason I'm vegan is because people should have personal autonomy, control of their own bodies. And so as long as your actions aren't hurting others in a needless way, then do what you want. Like, if you want to eat junk food, I eat, I eat junk food. I'm saying this to myself, because I eat crap junk food sometimes, right? I'm going to stop talking now. <laughs> Good question. I saw a hand over there, yeah. There's not a great deal you can do about it. Doctors... Um, on average, I don't know if it's the same in Germany, it will be very similar though. In the UK, they only receive 48 hours of nutrition training. They train for five years or thereabouts, but they get 48 hours nutrition training, which means those 48 hours are just recycled information that we just take for granted. You know, all meat is best for protein. You need to eat red meat for iron, blah, blah, blah. Um, so it's not like doctors are just following what they've been told in a very short space of time. Um, it, it, it was insane about hospitals, right? Is hospital food, is some of the worst food you can get, right? Like, in America, they have McDonald's near hospitals. Like, 
And we recognize that things like bacon, right, are, are a carcinogen, don't we? Like, bacon's a carcinogen, and you can eat bacon on a cancer ward. <laughs> like, it, it, it is distressing, to say the least, isn't it? What can you do about it? I'm not sure. There is this group called NFI. Maybe reach out to them. There's also, in America, oh, the Physicians for Responsible Medicine, P-R, Physicians, phys the Committee of Physicians for Responsible, and what is the abbreviation of that? PCRM. PCRM in America is, is headed by someone called Dr. Neil Bernard, who is fantastic. I like Dr. Neil Bernard. He's great. Um, so PCRM, reach out to them. Um, yeah, I think there's the NRI and PCRM, and see what they say. I'm not much help in that department, but you're welcome. It's a great question. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, what, what do I think about artificially produced meat? You mean like lab-grown meat? Yeah, yeah I think lab-grown meat is fantastic. Um, in the future, we can acquire it in a way that doesn't cause harm to animals. I mean, for, up until now, we've been taking bovine calf serum. Not, not good, not good at all. But the technology is passing that point now where we won't need bovine calf serum to produce lab-grown meat. So lab-grown meat, in effect, in the future, it will not only use 95% less water, 95% less land, it will also be carbon neutral because the whole system can be powered by, by renewable green energy. So there's no, uh, it would be carbon neutral in that sense. Um, and it's produced in an ethical way, so you're not, you're not, you, you eliminate animal farming, eliminate animal farming, eliminate the dangers, consequences, and suffering involved in that. And you get the exact same thing, but from, from cell culturing. Um, so in, in, in most respects, I think it's fantastic but I also am so annoyed by it, right? Because, it, first of all, we don't know when it's going to be available. It could be 10 years, it could be 15 years, it could be 20 years. We, we don't know. The people working on it, they don't know, right? It's new technology. It's not actually real technology in effect in a, in a commercially viable way yet. So we don't know when it's available. And I get people that say to me, look, Ed, like, I will stop eating animal products when I can get lab-grown meat. And I'm like, well, so we, for the next, what, 20 years maybe? You're just going to carry on? The United Nations told us last year that we have 12 years to avoid runaway climate change. That was about 18 months ago, which means we have 10 and a half years left. We've wasted 18 months. Let's say that it takes 12 years to get lab-grown meat, and then all of a sudden lab-grown meat's available, and we're like, yeah, hey, we can reduce the impact of animal agriculture now. And the United Nations goes, well, it's too late, right? It's well done, guys. It took too long. And so I think that my problem is, like, we have options available now, why do we have to produce the same thing in a laboratory to convince us to do something good? That upsets me. It's like, go into the supermarket, go to where the vegan food is, pick it up, take it to the cashier, scan it, pay for it, take it home, and eat it, right? And be done with it. This, this, this idea that we have to wait for this new technology, I found that really, I found it an indictment of our species that we, we rely so much on convenience that we want to even do something a little bit inconvenient, which is buy the product that's next to the one that we always buy. Now, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, that sounds overly critical, but it's simplistic terms, that's what we're asking, you know? So I think from like lab-grown meat, I think it's amazing. I think it'll change the world. Lab-grown meat means that we'll have no vivisection anymore. It means that we can do clothing, you know? We won't, to, you know, we won't kill animals for clothing anymore. We can produce that in a different way. It's amazing, it'll change the world, there's no doubt about it. But we don't have time to wait. So we have to do something now, right? Um, so yeah, amazing but disheartening at the same time. That's what I think. Also, like, veganism is a moral stance. The consumption is a symptom of the problem, but the mindset is the root of the problem. So it's how we view animals that's the root cause of the issue. We view them as being beneath us in, in, in a form of subordination. We can do what we want to them because of the way that we view these non-human animals. But actually, veganism is about saying actually their right to life is, well, their right, you know. It's not, our, their life is not ours to exploit and take. So it's not about not buying something, it's about changing mindsets. The problem with lab-grown meat is it doesn't necessarily compel us to change mindsets. We just buy the same thing we've always bought without having to think differently about why we're doing it. The other argument to side to that is actually, well, some people say change behavior, then change the mindset. That's actually quite psychologically true. You change people's behaviors, then their mindsets change afterwards. So if we get people buying lab-grown meat, then their mindset might change as a consequence of buying lab-grown meat. I don't know. Anyway, yes and no. I'm 98% delighted. I'm 2% frustrated, probably. <laughs> Why does the word veganism have such a bad connotation? What a, what a fantastic question. How long have we got, let's see? Two hours, great. Huh? Mm. 
A few reasons. Um, a few reasons. We hold what we eat very close to us. It's a personal identity. It makes up our cultures, our traditions. For many people, it's heritage. It's social environments. It represents memories. A lot of our memories are based around food environments we're consuming. And so we hold a lot of personal enjoyment, and satisfaction, and pleasure from situations involving animal products. Though those situations aren't completely uh, based around the animal products, but animal products are associated within them. The thing with veganism is it creates a dynamic that is forcing us to feel differently about the way that we've lived and also about our identities and what we hold close to us, our cultures. So I think that it's a defense mechanism to hate the word, or not, not to hate the word, but to create negative connotations around it. You create negative connotations, it means that you can step far back, which is why people will say, well, vegan, why, I, I, vegans can be so nasty. I had a conversation with someone, um, it's in my head because I'm editing the video right now, and, and in it he says, um, do you know what, the biggest problem isn't vegan food. He says the biggest problem is that some vegans aren't very nice. So we create in our mind, oh, you know, some vegans, they're a bit judgy. You know? Some vegans are judgmental. This one vegan told me on Facebook once that I was responsible for murdering animals, and so I'm gonna keep murdering animals because he really upset me. You know, like the, that's like the mindset, isn't it? That was a bit harsh, I didn't, that was a bit harsh. I didn't mean it like that, I'm sorry. But like, that's the mindset, isn't it? It's kind of like, if someone offends you, you place the whole philosophical idea onto that person who's upset you, because then you can dispute the whole philo philosophical idea. You go, well, this person was not very nice to me, therefore everything he stands for or she stands for is completely invalid. But we don't apply that anywhere else. I've met a lot of meat eaters who are very horrible people, but that doesn't mean that meat eaters in general are horrible people, right? And also, just because that one meat eater was horrible doesn't mean that meat eating is wrong because of that. It's wrong for all the other reasons, not because that one meat eater was not very nice to me. And so with veganism, you can't discredit a whole philosophical way of life because one vegan wasn't very nice to you, and you go, well, vegans are preachy and militant and extreme, right? Because we create these psychological connotations to make it easy to attach from wanting to change. Oh, I don't want to be like that, because that person was not very nice. But also, we have uh, this kind of binary set up, don't we? Vegans against the world. You know, vegans are going to steakhouses and they're doing this. Vegans are trying to do this. It, there was an article in the newspaper, the Daily Mail in the UK. It said, vegans are like Stalinists, right? We're like dictators, you know? We're just like, because you know, vegans are generally just like Joseph Stalin, right, Rally, Responsible for murdering millions. Oh. No, that's non-vegans who murder millions of, yeah, no, no, no. I'm being facetious again, I'm sorry. I'm being facetious. Relax, relax. <laughs> I get ahead of myself sometimes. But this is the thing, isn't it? Like, we, we do, we put a whole lot of connotations on specific ideas to make us feel less inclined to change to them. So, um, yeah, I mean, look. At the end of the day, people, a lot of people don't want to change. They feel that vegans are forcing and being preachy. And I get that. I used to feel the exact same way. 100% understand that. So then, we, so then we create negative connotations around the word to want to distance ourselves from. I think that's the bottom line. It's a psychological defense mechanism um, perpetuated by some vegans who do silly things. I'm not going to deny that. There's right now a vegan who's suing Burger King in the US. You know, the Burger King in the US have something called the Impossible Whopper, which is a plant-based burger in Burger King. They cook it on the same griddle where they cook the meat. And this vegan is now suing them because of cross-contamination. To me, that is the most stupid thing that they could do, right? Like, what impression does that give a vegans? Like, don't buy it then, right? They don't buy it then, you know? And so stuff like that doesn't help, doesn't help. And so I think that also adds to these negative connotations of vegans being a specific way. And so it means that as vegans, we have to be mindful of how we act, how we speak, how we are, because we can't avoid people having bad impressions of us. They always will. People aren't gonna like us simply because they know we're vegan. But at the end of the day, when we have conversations with people, when we can chat about these ideas, we can rationalize them, and people see that beyond veganism is actually a grounding of, of interesting ideas, at the very least, right? I think that's why. It's more complicated than that, though. Probably. Gosh, simplistic but complicated, isn't it? Um, yeah. What do you think about the Liberation Pledge? Uh, the question is, what do I think about the Liberation Pledge? The Liberation Pledge, great question, actually. The liberation Pledge is where you pledge not to eat animals around, or animal products around other people that are eating animal products. You have a group of friends, you're the only vegan, they want to go to a burger place, they want to buy beef burgers, you say, I'm not going because you're eating beef burgers. I've taken the Liberation Pledge. You wear a bracelet, which is why I'm doing this. You take the Liberation Pledge, and so you, the idea is that you're saying to people that you will not normalize it, right? Because the idea is if we around people, they're having a beef burger, we're having a vegan burger, we're all laughing, everything's normal. We normalize that process to the person. We say that eating that product is absolutely fine. I think 
There's two ways of looking at it. I don't think that we are obliged by any stretch to take the Liberation Pledge. I think that actually sometimes it's good, if you're in the right situation, to eat a vegan burger around people eating non-vegan burgers because you can show them how good that burger is. If you can get a Beyond Meat burger in a restaurant or in a takeaway, then do it. And if your friend is eating a non-vegan burger, get them to take a bite. Get them to have a bite. Try this Beyond Meat burger and see what you like. Because if they like it, then you can go, well, why not buy that in the future? Right, because there's all these reasons why you should. But if you weren't there in the first place, you've missed that opportunity, haven't you? So I think it's situationally dependent. My grandparents last year had their 60th wedding anniversary. 60 years, that's pretty crazy, isn't it? And so 60th wedding anniversary, the whole family gets together and we're gonna have a big meal together in this nice-ish place, right? And so I'm like, great, what am I gonna do? Do I go, what do I do? I get the vegan menu sent to me through the post. The dessert is fruit salad. I'm like, Christ, right? <laughs> I think it's probably like, you know, like the, the start, I can't remember what the start was. It was probably like tomatoes or something, you know, like, God, for God's sake. So I made the decision not to eat around them because they had like cheesecake, they had like pork loin, so like decadent foods, right? Luxurious foods in their eyes. And so if I'm going to sit there and they're eating like cheesecake and cream and stuff and I'm eating some grapes, they're going to be like, oh, vegan food is really bad, right? Because that's the, the image it portrays. But actually, if, the, if it had been the other way around, if it was like, hey, you're going to have this amazing start of this... Beyond Meat Burger, you're gonna have a vegan cheesecake, then I would have sat there and eaten it and gone, look, what's the difference? You know, I'm enjoying this just as much as you're enjoying yours, and this is the positives of what I'm doing. But instead, I didn't do that. I didn't eat with them, because I didn't wanna have that process of, you know, saying, look how rubbish vegan food is, and seem really miserable about it. So I think it's situationally dependent, and I think it's, we use our better judgment, but I, I don't think we have to take it. I don't think it's an obligation. I actually think that, um, I, I'm very cautious of, 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 of telling people how they should be with their friends and family because friends and family are instrumental and we can't, I don't think it's right to tell people how they should be with their friends and family if it risks those relationships. So yeah, I'm, 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 I think if you want to do it, I, I think it's amazing, I fully support it, I get the logic behind it 100%, I just also think that there's another reason to not do it as well. That's true. I mean, you also have to look after yourself. And so if you're an activist or you just care deeply about veganism and, and it hurts you to be around people doing that, well, look after yourself. Yeah, fundamentally, look after yourself as well. Don't put yourself in those situations if, it, if it's hurtful for you. But likewise, don't take yourself out of those situations if you think it's damaging to your relationships as well. I think both ways work fine. Um, one last question. Go on then. My friends, well, my family aren't vegan. My friends mostly. I've got a few non-vegan friends. Um, <laughs> but they're really sweet about it. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, Melanie Joy, who's a, a clinical um, social psychologist, she refers to people who aren't vegan but are sympathetic of veganism as vegan allies, and she thinks that's a good thing. I also think it's a good thing. Um, they're also hypocrites, but, you know, but it is also a good thing as well. It is a good, I, I, I like my non-vegan friends. They're very sweet people, very sweet people. They're just a little bit hypocritical. But no, um, so I do have non-vegan friends, but that, 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 that changes over time. So that's, that's, that's okay. That's okay. I'm not too worried about that because... I have really constructive conversations with them. But my, my family, uh, I wouldn't even classify as vegan allies. I'd do the opposite. Vegan enemies, probably, right? Uh, <laughs> anyway, look, anyway, okay. Look, right, I've got a few minutes. I'm going to rattle through this because it's, it's actually a really important topic. Um, family are the hardest people to speak to. I'd rather sit down and be grilled by 10 dairy farmers than have a conversation with my mum about veganism. I mean, I'd rather be shouted at by 10 dairy farmers and listen to my mum give me that look, you know? So, um, you know, because <laughs> she's terrified sometimes, right? She said to me about five weeks ago, um, she, looked, she, she came down to London to visit me before I came traveling. And she said, Ed, I'm never going to be vegan. I said, Mom, I didn't ask you. We weren't talking about veganism. It wasn't the topic of conversation. She just said it to me. And I was like, damn, that's hurtful, right? But let's take it back. Um, I've been vegan for about a year. And I decided to email my parents. In fact, emailing my parents was probably the first form of activism I did. And you've got, I use that word activism very loosely, right? Because I'm sat on Gmail. I'm not liberating, like, you know, chickens from factory farms, right? It's just, you know, everyone, some people in Balaclava is like liberating animals and I'm just on Gmail going, hi mom, you know? It's not really, but it, this was my first delve into activism, the first thing I did, right? Um, I said, hi mom, and then hi dad. My parents are both separated, they're both divorced. They divorced when I was about two years old. And so they're both remarried. And so I um, emailed them, hi mom, hi dad. You know, as you know, I've been vegan for a little while. I've never spoken to you about it. So I did a paragraph on ethics, a paragraph on the environment, a paragraph about health, 
Lots of love, your son Edward. And I included, yeah, thought that I could butter them up that way. And I put a little clip, and it was called The Secret Reason We Eat Meat by Dr. Melanie Joy, which is a fantastic video. It's non judgmental, it's non confrontational, it's strictly empathetic. It actually says, You do these things, these are all the reasons you do them. You're not a bad person at all because look at all these reasons why you do the things you do. I thought, This is amazing. Like, it's like, how could anyone be offended by this? Well, I found out, didn't I? So I sent it to my mum and I sent it to my dad. <laughs> my dad didn't reply to me, which is not uncharacteristic, because like I said, he did leave when I was two, right? So I'm used to being ignored by my dad. Like, <laughs> no, I'm totally fine. <laughs> I said, it's totally fine. It's totally fine, right? My mom did reply to me, and she said, God put animals on this planet for us to eat. My mom isn't religious. So what does that mean? She doesn't own a Bible, she doesn't go to church, and I'm not baptized. So what does that mean? I think my mum is a little bit religious, so that if it's true, and she gets to heaven's gate, she can go, well, I, I, I didn't say I didn't believe in you. I just, you know, she's just a tiny bit religious for safety reasons, I think, you know? Like, we probably all are a little bit, because I'm like, I, I say I'm an atheist, but then sometimes I'm like, sorry, you know, please forgive me. <laughs> Um, so she's a little bit for safety, um, but she's not really. She also said I was going to die from synthetic proteins, right? To this day, I don't know what a synthetic protein is, right? <laughs> and I'm really worried about them, right? Because they're out to get me, apparently. So I'm like creeping around corners carefully right now. Anyway, let's go back two years. So, so it didn't end up well, okay? It didn't end up good. So two years ago, I did a debate with a dairy farmer on the BBC. It was a live debate on television. I was feeling pretty good afterwards. I was quite happy with myself. The dairy farmer was a guy called Paul Tompkin. He's the head of Dairy UK. And I felt like I did an all right job. So I sent it to my mum and I sent it to my dad. And I was like, hey, just to let you know, I did this today. Would you like to watch it? They didn't know about my vegan advocacy. They didn't know about any of the things I did. So I just sent it to them. Uh, my mum replied being like, yeah, okay, I'll watch it later. My dad replied, and he said, oh, we watched it live this morning. You know, we know all about what you do, and you were very persuasive. Persuasive. And also, me and my, my dad are kind of like film buffs. It's, it's like our connection, right? We like films. And so my dad said, if it, was rock, it was, if it was a Rocky film, you were Rocky and he was Apollo Creed, which basically means that I, I beat him. You know, it's, it's a film reference. It's a bit nerdy, but it's how we get on, so it was nice. And that meant a lot to me. And so I was like, persuasive, you know? I was like, damn, that's amazing. And he, so he's like, I know, we watch you. And he said he was proud of me. I was like, that's come a long way, right? It's come a long, long way. It's come a long way from leaving, especially, but now he's proud of me. That's nice, isn't it? So I'm like, <laughs> I'm totally fine with it, all right? Don't worry about it. So, like, my dad's opened the door, hasn't he, right? And, like, he's, and he's, like, slamming the door, trying to close it. And I'm like, you said I was persuasive, Dad, so we're in this for the life now. I saw him about a year ago, maybe a little bit longer. He said to me, what supplements do you take? And I thought, Christ, here we go, right? I said to him, well, Dad, I take a vitamin D during winter because everyone should. And he said, well, that's funny. My doctor also told me I should take a vitamin D during winter. And I said, well, how about that, right? How, how about that? Like, we take the same supplements, you know? We're all good, aren't we? So, yep, that's right. And he said, well, the thing is, that it's all about taste, you know? If, if it, I can get vegan food that tastes the same, then, uh, then that's fine. And I said, well, we're good then, aren't we? You know? We're good. We're good. So, he's not vegan, no, no, no. But he is um, understanding, very, very nice. When I call him up, he's super interested. He tells me he's watched all these videos. Um, I did a talk at something called the UK Vegan Camp Out this year, um, and someone who worked in his office had flyers for it, and so he was flowering the office, and my dad was like, oh, that's my son speaking there, which was like super sweet, right? So, you know, what I'm trying to say is it takes a hell of a long time with family, and I'm still working very closely with mine. When my mum visited me, I said to her, I'll buy you a coffee, mum, but the coffee's got to have plant milk in, right? But I'll buy you it. You, I'll buy you anything you want, but it's got to be vegan, right? So she did, she had it, it was almond milk, and she liked it. And I thought, that, that goes a long way, you know? And so I think with family, it's about buying things in for them. Can you get them a plant milk, you know? Can you buy them a coffee? Can you take them out to a vegan restaurant and pay for their dinner? Can you do these things? Because it, it goes a long way in, in showing them things. Also with family, I get it, right? I get it. Like, my family tried to raise me to have good morals, to be a good person, with good values, whatever that really means. But to them, they tried to raise me to be a good person. I turn almost 21, and I say to my mum, I say, look, mum, I'm vegan now. And the reason I'm vegan is because I think it's immoral to kill animals. What, what I'm actually saying to her is the way you raised me is immoral. And not only that, but you live in a moral way as well. I think for a parent to hear that is probably one of the most challenging things they can hear from a child. You raised me wrong. You raised me in a way that I disagree with. And so I think any parent that, that goes vegan, or at least even says to their child, 
tell me why you're vegan, and listens. That, to me, that requires some of the, the, the most respect ever. The humility for a parent to do that, I think, is incredible. And so um, I get it. I do. I get it. It doesn't make it easier, but I understand why that might be the case. And so my mum says, you're going to die from synthetic proteins. It's outrageous. But what she's saying is she's worried about my health. Because my mum raised me to think that I needed meat for protein. I was 12 years old in that English literature class. Weak and skinny, right? Remember right at the beginning? Well, that was what my mum told me. So that's what she thinks. So it's no wonder she said that, because she's actually worried about me. So when I look behind the way she speaks, I, I get it. I get it. And when she said that thing to me about five and a half weeks ago, she said, oh, I'll never be vegan, you know. It was funny. I have a, a restaurant in London called Unity Diner. It's a non-profit vegan restaurant. And we'd gone there for lunch. And she'd not said anything about it, not a, not a word about it. She was sat there. We'd eaten. I looked at her. And for a split second, it looked like she was going to cry. She didn't say a word about it. I could see it in her eyes. And then it went, right? It started, and then, and then it stopped about a minute later. She didn't say a word to me. A couple of minutes later, she says, I'm never going to go vegan. And I think the reason she said that wasn't to be hurtful. I think it's because it's a defense mechanism. I think she, she, she'd eaten a nice meal. She'd enjoyed her lunch. She was in an environment that I was responsible partly for, 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 for creating. She probably felt some sort of emotion, right? Maybe pride, who knows, hopefully. And so she, she starts to feel something, and then she takes it back. And then the way to defend herself from feeling guilty or from acknowledging something, or maybe feeling sad because our relationship has become somewhat fragmented since I went vegan. She then says, I'm never going to be vegan, you know, because it stamps a defense mechanism for her psychologically, not to be offensive. So I think, I get it. I, I get it. It's hard. That's painful for me to think that. But I get it. You know, like, I know from how the, the family I was raised in, how emotionally repressed that family dynamic can be in, in, in my household. And so I understand where she comes from. But uh, it's hard with family. Because there's so much, there's layers and layers and layers. There's baggage and there's childhood things and all this stuff. And, it, and, it, and it's hard to come to terms with. Patience is so important. Offer to cook a meal. Offer to, to, would they like to watch this documentary? Can I buy them coffee? Can I try this food? Can you do this? Can you do that? Small steps with family go a big way, I think. That's what I've found out anyway. But I've still got many, many small steps to go. It's a hard one. I wish there was an easy answer. If you ever find it, please let me know. But I, I, there just isn't, I don't think, with family. It is, of every conversation I have with vegans, there's always the number one problem. How do I tell my family, how do I convince my family to be vegan? The truth is there's no answer to that other than patience and perseverance, I think. Or you have an amazing parent. Yeah. Not that my parents aren't amazing, but they're just a little bit less amazing than they could be, you know? No. no. Okay, right, I know. Um, <laughs> love you, mom. Love you, dad. No. Um, okay, right, thank you for listening. <laughs>